Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for coming. My name is uh, Gonzalo Cardoso. I'm a risk specialist at the Solutions and Services team based here in London. The main title of my presentation is Can a Project Finance Model Consider Regulatory and Political Risks? I'm going to divide my presentation in two main parts. First, I'm going to talk about general challenges that financial institutions and other market participants face when creating a project finance risk model and assess the risk of project finance transactions. I'm going to talk a little bit more on common concerns when it comes to low default asset cl uh, classes and also how a model framework should be developed to manage those risks. I'm also going to talk briefly on rating systems and also on the possibility of linking a rating to a probability of defaults or observed default frequency, based on uh, Standard Poor's default experience for more than 30 years. The second part of my presentation will be centered in the structure of a project finance model, pro project finance scorecards, particularly in our model, that intends to replicate Standard Poor's methodology and the new additions made in this version with the new criteria, or the recent criteria. Um, we believe the different risk dimensions and the reg regulatory and political risk factors that are present should be presented in similar frameworks that are intended to capture a project finance transaction. Therefore, I'm going to relate these specific risks and try to insert them in a model and in the end show a case study to describe how the model works. One of the main challenges for market participants is to take an informed decision manage risks, measure and price these risks, especially when they cannot rely on external public rating. To capture the possibility of a default risk in these structures is one of the main challenges for market participants in the rated and rated world of project finance. What we do in our department is to develop a framework where we extend the criteria from S&P and make participants able to produce an S&P rated equivalent for that unrated equivalent, which is much bigger than the universe of uh, Standard & Poor's ratings. Clearly, uh, the benefit on having such a framework is to help participants rank specific projects, give consistency in the assessment for different projects, and have a transparent framework. You can look into the rating, uh, deconstruct the rating, understand where the main risks are, understand where the main di dimensions, the, the critical dimensions and the, the drivers in terms of risk factors are and possibly try to mitigate these specific risk factors and these dimensions. In low default portfolios, banks have struggled with internal ratings based only on default data. In project finance or even sovereigns or financial institutions, it's very difficult to construct a quantitative model so what we do is to replicate the criteria and put it in a framework that combines quantitative metrics with qualitative metrics, with a qualitative assessment. We provide guidelines to make sure that this qualitative assessment is as objective as possible. The focus on these slides uh, here are more directed to the banking sector. Uh, if you want to rely on an observed default frequency, uh, you have to make sure that the outcome is uh, aligned with the methodology of that third party. Uh, nonetheless, we, in the last years we saw shifts uh, in the focus to capital market participants that also fund these projects, uh, insurance companies, uh, pension funds, asset managers, ECAs. This is also known as the shadow banking and their growth can be explained mainly by regulatory reasons. As shadow banking continues to provide funding for project finance and helping infrastructure growth, and it's known to exist uh, huge needs uh, in the world, these institutions seek not only something that complies with regulatory requirements, but also they want to identify investment opportunities and price them accordingly. One problem is that these institutions don't always have the resources necessary to deal with the extensive risk analysis that project finance requires. Um, and because of that, they might need an, uh, a tool to assess them in this risk. Uh, take, for example, the fact that many of these institutions do not take part in construction risk. Of course, as this can be for mainly risk return uh, reasons, uh, but also because there might be a lack on the tools to assist them with this uh, necessity. 
I'm going to talk a little bit more on the new framework. We have developed in Solution Services team our project finance scorecard that re replicates uh, Standard Poor's methodology. Um, the scope of this uh, of application is global from a geographical point of view. Uh, we want to make sure we can compare a school in Portugal uh, with a school in the UK. In terms of project finance sectors, the model is segmented in uh, power uh, generation, transmission, uh, infrastructure, uh, oil and gas, pipeline and storage, PPP, PFI, and a generic sector for every other um, type of assets that we are not considering here. Uh, we have sector-specific features in our models. Uh, for example, analyzing the transmission assess and curtailment risk as a competitive position factor may be important for a wind generator, but not for a toll road, where, for example, the organic road drivers in the region, like a diversified economy, income per capita, low unemployment, are much more important to be analyzed. The structure of our framework, or our model, comprises 77 risk factors, the majority of them being qualitative in nature, and those divided in two risk profiles and three external risk modifiers. Opposite to what happened in the corporate world, where we had um, a, an approach more of a weighted average, um, th this framework uh, gives the, the, the importance of how sometimes only one risk can undermine the credit quality of the structure. Um, so therefore, we have a, a semi-weakest link approach that uh, Im implies that more weight should be attributed to a specific risk factor. Uh, this year, we made uh, significant uh, changes on it. I'm going to talk a little bit about these changes and how they reflect and capture regulatory and political risks. We believe these inclusions should be present in any model that wishes to capture project finance transactions. Um, here, we will use the, the, the criteria of Standard Poor's, the framework criteria, to define if this is a project finance transaction or not. Afterwards, we have two profiles, the construction profile and the operations profile. In the construction profile, we are going to look at the design, if the design requires any modifications, if the design is adjusted to the project. We are also going to look at the technology, if the technology is commercially proven, if it's a new technology, if the technology is priced accordingly. Uh, we'll look at the construction risks, we'll look uh, at the experience of the contractors, uh, we'll look also at the degree of contract risk transfer to the contractor and how much volatility the, 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 the project in the construction uh, retains, and we'll look also at the complexity of the construction. We also have here some modifiers, the project management, we'll look how the construction was funding, this is very important, we look at the sources of funds, the uses of funds, that equity, uh, we'll look at the uses of funds, the construction costs, working capital, uh, reserves, and afterwards we will um, eventually cap this uh, construction profile to the credit quality of the contractor. We base this on a piece of criteria that's called the counterparty dependency assessment, and this, if a counterparty is material, we will look at if the counterparty can be also replaceable. So if the counterparty can be replaceable, then we do not need to be exposed to this specific counterparty, and we can have an adjustment in terms of notches. The same thing to the operations profile. Uh, we have uh, three main risk dimensions here that we call the OPBA, or the operations phase business assessments. The performance risk will look more into the operational risk factors, and also to supply risk. The market risk, here we'll look at um, how the project is insulated from market risk, either because of the stability of its cash flows, uh, making an, uh, uh, according to the base case uh, scenario and the downside case scenario, but also to the competitive market position. Uh, so how insulated is this project, either because it has a very good stability of cash flows or because it has a very strong competitive position. And afterwards, we'll use the country risk, which is going to be a new addition in this scorecard. This operations fa phase business assessment will be mapped to a DSCR table and will create the first part of our rating in the operations. We also have uh, modifiers here, the downside case scenario that will imply possibly that we can have an upgrade here in terms of uh, the outcome. We'll look at the debt structure, how the, the structure is amortized. We'll look at the liquidity, the refinance risk, if there is some, for example, if you are looking at a mini perm. Or, and 
Afterwards, the same thing as we have here, we'll look at the operations counterparty, uh, how that they might create, create a cap here, the off-takers, uh, O&M counterparty, a supply counterparty. One thing is important here is that when we have a standalone credit profile of the construction operators, if we are looking at the project finance transaction that has, in this case, construction, then this will be the lower between these two profiles. This will give us the project standalone credit profile. We'll also have some modifiers afterwards. We'll look at the parent and to look at the linkage uh, that the project has with its parents. The, pro the project might be kept by the, the, the strength of its uh, parents, but it might also be linked, and therefore we can upgrade some notches regarding to the, uh, to the parents. But the normal would be that the, parent, the project is delinked from its parents. We also looked at the structural protection. We have uh, uh, cash uh, covenants and also uh, limited uh, purpose uh, um, uh, covenants uh, to the, decide how uh, the, the structural protection. We have also government support, another piece of criteria, sovereign rating limits, and then the full credit guarantee, which could be, for example, a monoline insurance that will take the, the, the strength of the project to achieve the project finance issue credit rating. Um, one important uh, consideration for the quantitative factors, which is also a new feature, is um, regarding the financial benchmarks. Uh, when we look at the operations profile, let's take, for example, the minimum DSTR uh, present in a base case scenario. Uh, how do we know how much it takes in terms of DSTR for a merchant refinery in Dallas or um, uh, to be investment grades or an availability-based payments highway in the Netherlands? Because they have different and distinct uh, characteristics. This uh, operations business assessment um, is going to take three main factors as we look. The performance risk, the market risk, and the country risk. And this assessment is going afterwards to be benchmarked against a DSCR table. In this example, uh, that is uh, illustrative, uh, we can see that to achieve an investment grade at this point of the analysis, the highway in the Netherlands will need um, uh, a minimum DSCR of 1.51, and the refinery in Dallas of 1.77. So in this case, we can see that the operations phase business assessment of the highway in the Netherlands, because it's availability payments, they have much less market risk, uh, they have much less uh, the, the performance risk, will need to be lower than the refinery, which has a much more a complexity, um, is exposed to commodity, and therefore, uh, as an operations phase business uh, assessment of a seven. This comes from one uh, to uh, 12. We also have uh, scoring guidelines uh, that are provided for every qualitative risk factor. Um, and now after this introduction, uh, I believe you have a high level idea of our project finance scorecard works. Uh, let's go to the main subject of my presentation. Um, when it comes to analyze regulatory and political risks present on um, project finance transaction, one of the proxies that we use is the country risk. Um, so let's see the difference between country risk and, uh, and, and sovereign risk. So the sovereign risk reflects the likelihood of a central government meeting its financial obligations. Nonetheless, the sovereign rating itself may understate or overstate the country-specific risks that are relevant for non-sovereign credit risk analysis. In credit risk modeling, it's industry-wide practice to use the sovereign ratings as the sole factor to cap capture country risk. In this context, most, most often a sovereign rating is applied as a cap to an entity. Um, in our model, the outcome of the rating may also be kept or constrained by the rating of the country. In practice, the rating of the project finance structure can have a better score than the, sc the sovereign. The question we have to answer here is, if the sovereign defaults, is the project likely to default too? So as we saw before, we, we have a, a specific piece of uh, criteria, Standard Poor's has a specific uh, piece of criteria, and we also have a, an overlay that will study this possibility. But um, country risk is what we will use here as an input in the risk dimensions of the project finance scorecard, inside the risk dimensions. 
Country risk is the risk that an entity faces by having some of its operations or assets exposed to one or more countries. Uh, Country-specific uh, risks covered by this criteria consist of uh, economic uh, risk, institutional, governance effectiveness risk, financial system and payment of culture, rule of law risk. Uh, S&P Capital IQ has designed a framework that assesses country risk by identifying the critical risk dimensions and factors, and we count with more than 120 countries uh, in this model. Um, I think we have uh, here our risk specialist on country risk, Mr. Paulo Spadotto. If you have more questions on this, I believe you can speak with him afterwards. Um, I already spoke about construction risk being concerned to investors. Uh, alongside the complexity of the construction process, there are numerous associated risks to consider. Like uh, we said, the delivery method, design and technology, the contractor experience. Um, the, the, the manner of a project's contracts distribute risk between contractors and suppliers is also important. So if you understand construction risk in project finance, you have an extra opportunity in these markets. Um, so uh, let's look uh, here and uh, how we will capture in the scorecard different uh, exposures to different country risk in the construction phase. Uh, how will we capture, for example, the fact that we are building a project in Honduras, uh, not in the UK? So the first is regarding the risk transfer of the construction contracts. One of way to measure the effectiveness of the construction contracts is by assessing the risks of cost time overruns and the project performance that are transferred to the builder and how much risk the project retains, how much volatility the project retains and how much of the risk is transferred to the contractor. And uh, of course, afterwards, we're going to look also at the credit quality of the contractor. Uh, different types of uh, contracts in this case, the way we define these contracts, have uh, different types of contract risk transfer. For example, a turnkey contract should transfer to the contractor all of the responsibility of price increases and delays and give guarantees to the project, for example, that is fit for purpose. Whereas a constru construct uh, contract will normally limit the responsibility or, uh, or warranties and may not war warrant any failure uh, to the, uh, of the design to meet the objectives um, of the project. Uh, to address the fact that there is a possibility that the legal system of the country would not support the terms and conditions of the contract, our model will take the country risk number, because the country risk would be a number from 1 to 10, 10 the more risky, 1 the less risky, as a proxy, and we'll assess this contract risk tra transfer at least to the next week weakest uh, assignment. This means, for example, that in Honduras, in fact, we could do not consider uh, to have a turnkey contract, unless it is properly mitigated, of course. Um, we can see here, for example, um, in the construct risk assessments, uh, the, the contractor is experienced, the type of contract here is a turnkey contract, uh, and therefore we have a preliminary construction based assessment um, of, uh, I'm sorry, A minus. Uh, the same thing if we have a contractor experience, but we are, for example, in a regime, in another legal regime, in another uh, country risk that has a high risk, then we will not consider a turnkey contract, we will consider a construct contract, and therefore the delivery method will be very weak, and this will uh, go for a double B that compares here with the A minus in the same situation if we are, for example, in the UK. The second way we capture in the scorecard different exposures um, uh, to different country risks is in the construction pro profile. This is also a new addition, the financial risk adjustments. We are going to look here how the project uh, is funded. We are going to look to the sources of funds and to the uses of funds. The idea is that the funds should be correctly allocated where they are needed in order to minimize the risk of the construction and that the sources should be as certain as possible. So we will take the account the country risk here when we analyze the sources of the funds. We will analyze the certainty and availability of each funding source relative to the timing of its use. What we do in terms of the model actually is we need more certainty to reach the same risk level if we are talking about uh, certain jurisdictions in a high risk country uh, level. 
Um, in this example here, uh, you can see uh, that we look at the uses of funds uh, for, for example, a, a country in the uh, United Kingdom, a project in the United Kingdom, another one in Honduras. I'm sorry to be speaking about Honduras uh, all the time. I hope no one is from Honduras. It's just a, an, an example. Um, uh, if you see here, for example, the sources of funds, this is the, the same. It, it's considerably marginally negative. Um, when we look at the sources of funds in the United Kingdom, uh, the, the, the same um, risk factor score, it would be marginally negative, but it would be negative if we are looking at the country risk in Honduras. Now let's go here to the, the effects of, uh, of these examples. So we can see here is that when we talk about the contract risk transfer, how much the project in construction, the project uh, uh, retains of risk that was not passed to the constructor, we can look here, A minus goes to a double B, because, so this is the effect of the contract risk transfer. If you look at the financial risk adjustments, we already had here a two notches downgrade that will come to a triple B. Now we will have an extra notch, three notches, because only of the effect of country risk acting here. Um, now we can look uh, at um, the, the uh, regulatory and political risks in the operations profile. So when we look at regulatory risk, this deals with potential for shifts in the government or policy framework, uh, offer an advantage or disadvantage to a company um, or project operating under its rules. We count again with the operations phase business assessments and we're going to look here at the market risks. Regulatory risk we'll see here in the competitive market position. So we will look at the competitiveness, for example, if we're looking at the road, bridge, tunnel and ports or infrastructure, and we look at the regulatory supports. If we're talking, for example, for a wind generator, uh, the uh, feed-in tariff probably is in place. Let's look at regulatory supports. How predictable is this, uh, is this um, uh, 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 feed-in tariff and the cash flows that come from that? In terms of political risk, we're going to look here how the country risk enters in the operations profile. If you're looking at Austria, that's a low risk. We start with operations phase business assessment of three, we'll end up in three. If we are looking, for example, at Azerbaijan with high risk, three will go to a four. Don't forget afterwards, this will be mapped to the DSCR table. And, and if we are talking about Bangladesh, which is a very high risk, a three will come to an eight. Um, let's see how this works now in practice with a, with a case study. Um, afterwards, if you have some questions at, uh, regarding the case study, I have to say that the analyst of Standard Poor's is seated uh, among you, so I'm sure that she can take some, some questions too. Um, this, uh, the project description, uh, it's a, a, a case, um, a project finance in Spain. There is no construction risk, only operation risk. It's the refinancing of the construction of 250 uh, megawatt solar thermal plants. Uh, parabolic through technology, uh, renewable project under the new Spanish regulation, debt of 285 million, fully amortized for 20 years, uh, supported by a feed-in tariff, 3.5 year debt-free uh, tail until the end of uh, the life of the plants. Of course, afterwards they can, can continue selling to the pool. Uh, this technology has a proven track record of 33 years and is the most mature technology for the production of solar thermal electricity. One thing is important here is that Abengoa Solar España is undertaking the O&M. Um, Abengoa Solar Experience is extensive compared with the industry average, or at least Standard Poor's considered it like this. The sponsor is Abengoa Yield PLC, it's a double B stable, a subsidiary of Abengoa Concessions Investment Limited. So let's look first at the operations phase business assessment. We are looking at the performance risk, the market risk, and the country risk. First part is the performance risk. The analysis will start with what we call the asset class operation stability assessments. We will look if the cash flows that are supposed to come in terms of operating risks are the, the same as expected. For example, if we look at barracks or a school, we'll have here an asset class operation stability assessment, which is also a number that comes from 1 to 12, very simple. 
If we are looking, for example, of a refinery, because it has more operating risk, uh, uh, then we will look at um, another um, number, probably, for example, let's say seven. But this, of course, depends. So for a every asset, we have a specific asset class as uh, a COSA or asset class stability assessments. And this will be the point of uh, um, uh, analysis, the, the initial point of our ana analysis. We're going to adjust it here. And in this case, because the, the, the O&M provider is more experienced, this will have an extra uh, adjustment here for the four that will become a three. A four assessment includes solar thermal uh, due to the sophistication of the technology and requires more, of course, specialized skills and equipment to maintain the performance. Um, in this case, as I said, the Abigo Solar Experience uh, has, uh, is very good in operating this kind of plant. So because of this, uh, we are going to give this, uh, this notch. Now let's look also in the performance, because uh, su supply risk comes here. The, uh, we are going to look also at uh, the resource and raw material risk. Uh, in this case, it's modest. Uh, because it's based on the independence expert opinion of resource estimation, the amount of nearby on-site data of resource available. What does this modest mean in terms of solar resource? A high level of confidence in the resource estimation based on a reliable analysis for multi-year data on-site that supports a long-term view of resource availability. In this case, it's important that we're dealing with P90 and not, for example, P50 or P75, as we see, in, for example, in the unrated uh, world. Market risk assessments. We'll look, uh, is the project exposed to market risk? Uh, so, uh, as I said, we'll look at the cash flows ab available for that service, the base case scenario and the downside case scenario, and we'll look at this decalage or this uh, difference. In this case, with the Spanish a uh, new remuneration system for renewable energy facilities. Uh, there is a, a market revenue equivalent to the electricity produced and sold every hour to the pool market. We have also a specific remuneration divided by installed capacity and an extra return on operation. As per the regulation of this facility, only 15% of the revenues of the cash flows have temporary merchant risk. But even this is subject to pool price fluctuations, so we are not very exposed to market in this specific um, uh, project. Therefore, we will score it very low. In terms of regulatory support and predictability, we scored it uh, neutral. And why neutral? We knew that uh, in Spain, electricity tariffs were set at levels that did not fully uh, recover the costs of productions, uh, coupled with a drop in the energy demands. Um, after 2008. This made cost recovery impossible. The tariff deficits ballooned to 26 billion in the middle of 2013, and this came with cuts in subsidies, as uh, some of you know very well, that harmed the investor confidence. With the 2014 Royal Decree, we have a new transparent regulatory regime that appears sustainable, but it still lacks a track record. So in this case, we consider it ne neutral. Of course, here, when we, when we look at the, the, the market risk and then at the competitive uh, market position, because this, this, this is very low, uh, it's not exposed to the competitive market position, we'll give a score of one uh, in, a, in, a, in a scale from one to four. Country risk, it's Spain. We have a new assessment from July 15 that came from moderately high risk to intermediate risk, and it reflects the views that the corporate entities have on a sustainable basis restored their access to the foreign capital markets. So this uh, has a rebound in investor confidence, and because of this, we'll have a score of four. So we can see here how we constructed the operations business assessments. From a scale of one to 12, we'll give it a five. Performance risk is a four, scale of one to 12. What are the risk drivers? Technology, good operational track record that we saw, the, the thermal technology, O&M experience of Abengoa, modest resource risk. Then in terms of mother, mo market risk, very good. One in a scale from zero to six. Low market uh, exposure, transparent and predictable regulatory framework, but without a track record. And then we do have a negative delivery cost relative to peers, because uh, we're talking, after all, it's a technology that needs uh, subsidies. Uh, in terms of country risk, a scale of one to 10, we have a four, which is the Spain uh, intermediate risk. Let's look here at uh, financial strength. As we said, the OPBA will map it to the SCR table. 1.60 will give us a straight initial 
rating here, that uh, standalone credit profile, which is a triple B minus. Then we are look at the downscale case, case scenario. And here, because only 15% of the revenues have temporary merchant risk, and there is a protection of the remuneration framework, the, what we are going to stress here, because after all, what we're doing in the downside case scenario is stressing everything uh, that, that we can in terms of market risk now. Uh, we are going to look here to the, to, to the reasonable rate of return. This is linked to the Spanish government 10-year bonds. If it changes, there is an expectation, and this is from part of the Standard & Poor's uh, uh, analysts, that the government will compensate the generator to offset the decrease in this return. So, it was considered that this project is in the A category. Uh, the project should generate the SCRs above one, under the downside case, and with a substantial debt servicing cushion supported by debt service coverage and liquidity reserves. So this will give us an extra notch to the triple B minus that we have. In terms of debt, uh, debt st uh, structure, the project is uh, amortizes reason reasonably. Average DSCR of 1.38 maintains the project in the triple B category. Uh, we have increased ratios uh, uh, that factor any potential uh, uh, adjustments. Then uh, we'll look at the liquidity. In this case, it's neutral. We have a six-month debt reserve account, also a contract agreement to retain at least three million in cash. And we will look at the counterparties, the counterparty dependency assessment that I was looking that comes in the operation profile. In terms of O&M counterparty, uh, no CDA is applied. We believe that there are suitable alternative oper operators available in the field of, re and there is a good field of replacement in the country, of course. Revenue counterparty, uh, in this case, there is no clear off-taker because uh, this uh, comes from the regulated market and liberalized markets. So the collection risk here will reflect the rating on Spain that was upgraded recently to triple B plus. Uh, so therefore is not an actual constraint right now in the rating. And then the financial counterparties, we're going to look to Citibank and Banco Santander that they are, uh, no, uh, they are not a, uh, a cap right now. So the final rating here, according to uh, Standard & Poor's and also that is mapped through our scorecards. We can see here that we started, we do not have any construction profile. In the operations profile we started with triple B minus. The downside case scenario gave us an extra notch to triple B and then the sovereign rating of a triple B plus is not, does not act as a cap achieving the triple B in the final rating. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm open to any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, for the, in the case study there, the regulatory support was given neutral. Uh, I was slightly surprised just insofar as Spain obviously had those retrospective changes to the feed-in tariffs. What would it take for it to be a negative? Mm -hmm. Well, um, it, it's important to say here first that we are not standard on poor's. So uh, one thing is the assessments that we make using the model. Uh, uh, another thing is what standard poor's believes. So m our opinion and the opinion that I'm going to tell you n right now is not exactly the opinion of standard poor's, more the opinion, let's say, of our department in risk solutions. Um, in um, uh, the last year, for example, before or 2013, when the cuts uh, were being made and bef before the new regula uh, regulator, uh, regulation came, we would consider it negative. What we see right now in terms of the Spanish uh, energy um, system is that there is a new regulation, a transparent regulation. This provides us with more predictability. But also, one thing that is Im important is that it insulates more the projects and the feed-in tariff projects from market risk that we have. So we have more confidence. And because we have more confidence and the, the, the project, as you saw, only 15% of the revenues were exposed to market risk, and even these, they, they were in, uh, in bands, so uh, there is not a... Uh, uh, there is some stability, we uh, consider it to be neutral. Why do we consider it to be neutral? Because it still lacks uh, some history, right? So because of that, we are not going to consider it positive. Uh, it's no longer negative because this will help the, the, the energy deficit that was created. 
and uh, therefore we, we, we think it's neutral right now. Thank you. Um, quick question. Uh, how often do you revise your assessments and ratings of? Mm -hmm. um, how do we revise our, our, I don't know, how do you we test the scorecards? Uh, no, how do, uh, we uh, do you, do you re review them and issue new scorecards over the lifetime of, a, of, a, of an issue? I can answer that, Gonzalo, if you want. So if the, uh, if the question is how often do we revise our ratings, that's the standard and poor ratings. Um, under regulation, we have to look at a rating at least once a year. Uh, in some cases, if there is a specific instance for that particular rating that requires us to go and look at that rating again, we might do it more than once a year, but certainly at least once a year. And actually, while I have the microphone, I have managed to pick up someone's pack it has some beautifully handwritten notes on Mike Wilkins' performance. So if you have lost it, it can be negotiated. <laughs> okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for your help. Bye-bye, for your attention.